Now at 11, a somber mood over the grounds of UVA. Three football players killed in a shooting. Two more people in the hospital. Hundreds of students filled the South Lawn tonight for a moment of silence. How the UVA community is remembering the victims. After hours on the run, police arrested the man accused of pulling the trigger. The suspect, a former UVA football player. He was real paranoid when I, when I talked to him about something. He wouldn't tell me everything. Tonight, the suspect's father talks about his son's state of mind leading up to the shooting. Tonight, hearts are heavy on the grounds of UVA. You're watching a vigil to remember three students shot and killed after returning from a class trip to D.C. Two other people were wounded in the shooting. Our crews have been in Charlottesville since last night. We've learned the young men who were killed are UVA football players, Devin Chandler, Deshaun Perry, and Lavelle Davis, Jr. For several hours, the campus sheltered in place as authorities searched for the suspect. Tonight, 22-year-old Christopher Jones, Jr. is behind bars in Henrico County and his father is speaking out. We have team coverage. Angela Vargas is in studio with us with more on the young man killed, but we start with Sarah Hammond. She's live at UVA where students held a candlelight vigil tonight. Sarah. Earlier tonight, hundreds of students filled the South Lawn to honor the victims. But even though that lawn was packed with grieving students, teachers, and community members, it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. It's truly shocking. Kind of numb. It's scary. The University of Virginia community is shaken. Three of their fellow students dead. Two others remain in the hospital. The morning began with houses around campus showing their support with signs flying the football players' numbers. As the sun set on a heartbreaking day here in Charlottesville, the community took to prayer. For the young Pews were packed at St. Paul's Memorial Church just down the street from where the students were shot. Those left alone and those who struggle to get through one more day. Then students took to the South Lawn. Hundreds lit candles, the silence making the pain and grief so clear. For 30 minutes, the UVA community sat in the grass, holding and supporting each other. Tears in their eyes as they blew out their candles and walked home. And classes in any other university events have been canceled again tomorrow. And UVA President James Ryan says they've asked faculty to be lenient with students in terms of assignments and attendance. Live in Charlottesville, Sarah Hammond, 13 News Now. And here at home, even more tributes are pouring in for the victims tonight. Angela Vargas picks up our team coverage in the studio. He tells us how former teammates and coaches are remembering the young lives lost. Angela. Well, the tragedy is sparking emotions of heartache, sadness, and reflections on social media. Family, friends, and people across the country are sending their prayers online, and their words are allowing us to know more about the three UVA football players on and off the field. Devin Chandler, Deshaun Perry, and Lavelle Davis Jr. are gone too soon. Many UVA football players are taking to social media saying their hearts are broken over the loss of three of their brothers. Man, it's just heartbreaking. Today, teammate Aaron Famui was at the crime scene devastated. You see three young boys. Had a whole future ahead of them. Just to see them gone. This is just heartbreak. Other players wrote they were great players and even better great men off the field. A UVA professor, Jack Hamilton, expressed the first time he met Lavelle Davis Jr. and Devin Chandler, calling them wonderful people. In a tweet, he said that he helped Devin declare an American Studies major, and he always had a huge smile, really gregarious and funny. One of those people who's just impossible not to like. 
Hamilton also said Lavelle Davis Jr. seemed to go out of his way to make friends with non-athletes. Chandler's former high school football coach in North Carolina also spoke about his former player. He was going to be a leader in whatever he chose to do, in whatever field he wanted to work in. Um, and uh, and unfortunately, the, the, the world uh, lost a good one. Banners of the three players' jersey numbers are up on the UVA grounds and are being shared now on social media. one fifteen forty one. But they are more than numbers. They are family, students, and loved ones who had bright futures. Here at home, Christopher Newport University is also showing support for UVA. Tonight, several students met in front of their campus holding a candlelight vigil of their own with the caption captains for who's and governor glenn youngkin has ordered flags to be flown at half staff throughout the commonwealth starting tomorrow angela vargas 13 news now thanks angelo tonight we're learning more about one of the two people who survived the shooting our sister station in baton rouge louisiana has been in touch with the family of michael hollins he also was a uvo football player they say he's out of surgery and is in the ICU tonight. One of the former high school teammates says the shooting comes as a complete shock. Great all-around dude. Um, doesn't run into trouble, stays out of trouble. Um, I can say if his friends are in trouble, he's going to do whatever it takes to protect his friends. That's the type of person he is. The Hollins family says Michael is expected to have more surgery tomorrow. There are still so many unanswered questions tonight, including why the shooting happened. This morning, UVA officials mentioned there have been previous disciplinary incidents involving the suspect. At a news conference Monday morning, University Police Chief Timothy Longo said he wanted to be transparent about previous incidents involving the suspect, 22-year-old Christopher Jones, Jr. Back in September of 2022, our Office of Student Affairs reported to the multidisciplinary threat assessment team that Mr. Jones, they received information that Mr. Jones had made a comment about possessing a gun to a person that was unaffiliated with the university. But Chief Longo said the comment was not made in conjunction with any threats. The Office of Student Affairs followed up with the reporting person and made efforts to contact Mr. Jones. In fact, they followed up with Mr. Jones' roommate, who did not report seeing the presence of a weapon. But before that, Chief Longo said another incident had also put the suspect on the radar. Because he was involved in a, a hazing investigation of some sort, I don't know the facts and circumstances of that investigation. I know that uh, it was eventually closed uh, due to uh, witnesses that would not cooperate with the process. But through the course of the threat assessment team's investigation, we learned of a prior criminal incident involving a concealed weapon violation that occurred outside the city of Charlottesville in February of 2021. Chief Longo said student policy says Jones was required to report that, but he never did. And so the university has taken appropriate administrative charges through the university's Judiciary Council, and that matter is still pending adjudication. And tonight, Jones is in custody in Henrico County, where he grew up. We're told police arrested him near his family's home 12 hours after the shooting. Our partner station in Richmond tried to speak with his mother. She was sobbing as she tried to make sense of the accusations against her son. She said there were no warning signs. Jones's father says his son was well-liked and a good student. But he says a month ago he noticed something was off. He had some problems uh, when the last time I talked to him, he said uh, some people was picking on him or whatever. Uh, he didn't know how to handle it. I just told him, you know, just don't go to school, don't pay him no mind, do what you got to do. He was he was real paranoid when I when I talked to him about something. He wouldn't tell me everything. I don't know what happened between then and now to cause to cause this uh, to happen. According to the Henrico County Sheriff's Office, Jones is scheduled for a video arraignment tomorrow. He is charged with second-degree murder. Count on 13 News Now to bring you any breaking updates as this story unfolds. And tomorrow, our crews again will be in Charlottesville and in Henrico County for the suspect's arraignment. Follow along on air, online, and on our streaming app, 13 News Now Plus. Next, almost one week after midterms, control of Congress is still up in the air. How many more seats Republicans need to win the House? For the first time since January 6th, former VP Mike Pence is speaking out about what happened behind the scenes that day. Plus, 
whether he's considering a run for the White House in 2024. President Biden's student loan forgiveness program hits another roadblock. The Verify team finds out why the application portal is now closed. And I'm tracking a storm that will bring rain to Hampton Roads tomorrow. I'll time out its arrival after the break. We're back with a live look over Capitol Hill. Newly elected lawmakers arrive for orientation today, a week after the midterms. And control of Congress is still up in the air. Democrats held their majority in the Senate. The House is yet to be called. More than a dozen races remain outstanding. Republicans need just six seats to gain the majority. Republicans had predicted a so-called red wave this election, but at least 30 of the former president, Trump's hands picked candidates, lost including several high-profile election deniers. And tonight, former Vice President Mike Pence is speaking out for the first time since the January 6th insurrection. In an exclusive interview with ABC World News Tonight anchor David Muir, Pence didn't hold back against his former running mate. In his first network television interview since the deadly January 6th Capitol attack, former Vice President Mike Pence taking aim at his former boss. Sitting down with ABC World News Tonight anchor David Muir ahead of the release of his book, So Help Me God, Pence calling former President Trump's words on January 6th reckless. The president's words that day at the rally endangered me and my family and everyone at the Capitol building. Several of the rioters threatened Pence's life as they tried to stop him from the ceremonial duty of certifying the 2020 election results. <laughs> Pence describing how he refused to let Secret Service agents take him away from the Capitol. I just didn't want those rioters to see the vice president's motorcade speeding away from Capitol Hill. I didn't want to give them that satisfaction. Asked about his own political ambitions and if Trump should run again for president. I think there will be better choices. Better choices than Donald Trump. Um, and uh, for me and my family, we... Uh, We'll be reflecting about what our role is in that. Will you run for president in 2024? Well, we're giving it consideration in our house, prayerful consideration. So if you decide to run and he's up there, so be it. <laughs> so be it. Tomorrow in Florida, former President Trump is expected to announce his third consecutive bid for the White House. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. Big news from Virginia Beach City Councilman Aaron Rouse. Today he announced he's running for Virginia's 7th District Senate seat. Congresswoman-elect Jen Kiggins holds that seat right now. She must resign before taking office in January, which will trigger a special election. Rouse says he hopes to have a greater impact representing Hampton Roads at the state level. So much that's in this upcoming election from a woman's fundamental right to choose which I will fiercely defend, to the efforts that will set us back on voting rights, to addressing the climate change, protecting the Chesapeake Bay and our waterways, to criminal justice reform. Rouse will face Republican challenger and veteran Kevin Adams, who announced his plans to run last week. This election is critical for Democrats who currently control the state Senate 21 to 19. Tonight marked the 22nd year for Military Appreciation Night at Old Golden Corral restaurants in Hampton Roads and across the country. Through the years, the project has raised nearly $18 million for the group Disabled American Veterans. Tonight, Golden Corral pres presented a check to the DAV for $100,000. It warms my heart that an organization such as Golden Corral, with so many facilities across the nation, is able to step up to the place and just give our veterans this kind of love and warmth and validation. Um, it's just second to none. Since Military Appreciation Night began in 1999, Golden Corral has provided more than 6 million free meals to vets. After spending nearly two months at sea, the Coast Guard cutter Northland is back home in Portsmouth. They spent 59 days on patrol in the Caribbean where they made a major drug bust. And on their way home Friday, they unloaded more than $100,000 worth of cocaine at a port in Florida. 
New at 11, Carnival Cruise Line is stepping up operations in Norfolk. Today, the city announced the company will double the number of cruises offered out of the Mermaid City next year. Those trips will also be available from May through October. Carnival is aiming to offer cruises from Norfolk year-round by the year 2025. Time for another check of the forecast with Evan. We are looking at rain and slightly cooler temps tomorrow. Yeah, and even in the extended forecast, we're looking at chilly temperatures. Have me thinking about a Caribbean cruise where it's certainly a little bit warmer than it will be here in Hampton Roads. And I'll even have a look at the long-range forecast as we head towards Thanksgiving. But right now, looking at a, queer, a clear sweep here on radar this evening. And we've seen a couple of clouds around the area as we have gone through the day today, generally partly sunny skies. And we're looking at partly cloudy conditions here right now. But here's the next storm system developing across areas of the deep south. You can see snow falling as far south here a little bit earlier today through northern Texas and even still here in Arkansas. We're seeing a little bit of snow. There's some cold air behind it. That's what will be here later this week. And while we're not forecasting snow, we are looking at a chilly rain as we head through tomorrow evening. Overnight, partly cloudy skies. Temperatures tomorrow morning generally in the 30s for most of us, right around the mid-40s at the coastline. And as the sun comes up, we might see a few peaks of sunshine to start the day, but the clouds will thicken up pretty quickly through the morning and by midday. Already looking at a few scattered showers, temperatures in the upper 50s, and then a little bit of a steadier rain coming in as we head towards the end of the evening rush hour tomorrow. Here's 6 o'clock. Looking at that steadier rain, especially through central Virginia, that'll overspread the region as we go through tomorrow evening. So this time tomorrow, likely tracking some leftover showers, maybe even an isolated thunderstorm pushing through the area. The good news is that'll just about all be out of here by Wednesday morning, maybe a couple of lingering showers through North Carolina. And Wednesday's not looking like a bad day. Some clouds in the morning, partly sunny skies into the afternoon, but then the core of the colder air will move in for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. High temperatures as we go into the weekend, only around 50 degrees, well below our normal high this time of year. As far as rainfall amounts tomorrow, generally a half inch to maybe an inch of rain across the area. Could be a little bit more if you pick up one of those heavier downpours or an isolated thunderstorm does develop. And then this is the six to 10 day outlook. So this takes us November 20th, next Sunday through next Thursday and much of the East Coast still dealing with below normal temperatures. So it does look like a chilly start to the Thanksgiving holiday here in Hampton Roads. Right now we are looking at partly cloudy skies, 45 degrees with an easterly wind coming in at six miles per hour. It's 30 in Franklin, 34 in Husky, 35 Gloucester, 45 in Norfolk, 29 one of the cooler spots up in Melfort, 30 in Wakefield, 38 Portsmouth, 46 in Moyock, and 38 in Hampton. So for tonight, 42, although it'll be in the 30s in those inland spots with partly cloudy skies and rain developing in the afternoon and into the evening. Cloudy and breezy, 60 degrees and then 50 tomorrow night with occasional evening rain and maybe an early morning shower Wednesday. Then becoming partly sunny into the afternoon, 58 degrees and then the temperature drops again. 50 on Thursday, 50 Friday, 49 Saturday, 50 Sunday, 48 Monday as the below normal temperatures over 10 degrees below normal continue right into early next week. Evan, thank you. Next, another setback for student loan forgiveness, why the application portal unexpectedly closed, and what this means for borrowers. President Biden's plan to wipe out millions in federal student loan debt this has hit another snag. Today, a federal appeals court issued a temporary injunction barring the move. That means the student loan forgiveness program is closed for the time being. So what does this mean for borrowers? Adian Deteal with the Verify team explains. Another setback in President Biden's plan to relieve millions of dollars in student loan debt for Americans. A ruling by a district court in Texas says Biden's plan is unconstitutional. This comes about a month after a U.S. Circuit Court paused the program. During the pause, eligible borrowers were still encouraged to apply for up to $20,000 in relief on certain loans held by the Department of Education. But following this Texas ruling, people are now claiming that the application has been closed. But is that true? Let's verify. Our sources are the Student Loan Debt Relief Program application, the U.S. Department of Education, and Brown versus the U.S. Department of Education. The plaintiff in Brown versus the U.S. Department of Education argued that before a federal agency like the Department of Education can implement a program, they're required by law to seek public comment. On November 10th, a Texas court agreed, ruling the Department of Education illegally skipped that step before rolling out the student loan forgiveness plan. The court blocked the program after declaring it was unlawful. 
The next day, the application form for the student loan forgiveness program was taken down. So we can verify, yes, applications for the student loan forgiveness program are currently closed. The Department of Education has filed an appeal which would elevate the case to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. On Monday, a separate federal appeals court panel also issued a new ruling, extending the pause on the program. To date, more than 20 million Americans have applied for forgiveness. With your Verify, I'm Ariande Till. If you have a question for the Verify team, just email verify at 13newsnow.com and we will work to get you some answers. Coming up in sports, the Commanders game has just gone final in Philly. Did they serve the Eagles their first loss or would they give it away late? That's after the break. And now, the Window World Sports Report with Connor Rio. Well, for us fans, sports provides an escape from the tragedy that too often consumes the other parts of life. It's an escape full of spectacle, passion, but above all, unity. Whether it's teammates forming lifelong bonds or the connection with a stranger that shares an affinity for your favorite team, these games, meaningless in the grand scheme of things, bring people together. Last night, that wall of low stakes comfort, that escape hatch, was shattered by the evil that fans are so often running away from when they come to this corner of humanity. A tragedy beyond words, three lives lost and countless others forever changed. Devin Chandler, Deshaun Perry, and Lavelle Davis Jr., each so special in their own way. Immensely talented on and off the field. Many of us mindlessly scrolled social media today in search of words, answers, anything to make it make sense. But nothing does, nothing can. But what some did find was that. Thousands of students gathering on the South Lawn in Charlottesville together. They didn't find words or answers, but they did find each other. Sports may not have provided that escape today that it so often does, but unity persisted in the face of tragedy. And the memories of Devin Chandler, Deshaun Perry, and Lavelle Davis Jr. will also persist from the immense impact they made while they were here. Rest in peace. Now, it's nearly impossible to talk about anything else today. The Commanders did make a trip to Philly for a date with the unbeaten Eagles that just went final about 30 minutes ago. Things started out as they have often this season for Philly. Taylor Heineke, the strip sack early in the first quarter. The Eagles would recover, and then they would go on to score shortly thereafter. But that, from that point on, something strange happened. Washington came alive. That's right, that commander's running game that's been absent at points this season. Now, Dallas Goddard scores here on the pass from Jalen Hurts. That made it 14-7. Eagles 14-10 when we pick it up with Brian Robinson refusing to not score. Taylor Heineke is absolutely amped. Washington took the lead there and they would not relinquish it for the remainder of this contest. In the third, Taylor Heineke finds the explosive to Terry McLaurin. McLaurin spent three quarters tearing up that vaunted Philly secondary, and then with the Eagles down just five late, Taylor Heineke takes a knee on third down. They're ready to punt this ball away with a minute 40 left instead. They get the personal foul, roughing the passer penalty there. They keep the ball, and they hand the Philadelphia Eagles their first loss of the season. A couple Taylor Heineke fans in attendance at his alma mater as ODU takes on Virginia Wesleyan in basketball here, and Chauncey Jenkins detonates with this block right here. Talk about explosives, some serious athleticism. The Monarchs out on the break and Dorico Williams would finish. Now ODU taking on Virginia Wesleyan. They overwhelmed them in the open court. They overwhelmed them on the boards. Makai Long specifically had a whole lot of athleticism that this team could not handle. Jenkins for three. That's a big area that ODU is focused on. But let's talk about Virginia Wesleyan for a second. A good team in their own right, usually a national contender in Division Three. They actually won the second half by a point. So not a bad showing from Virginia Wesleyan on the road, but ODU ultimately overwhelms them 72 to 58. So a tough day in sports. Mm, Tomorrow's a new day. Back to you guys. We will continue to cover it.